All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jacques Dupria. I'm the CEO of the FW de Klerk Foundation, and we're joined today by Advocate Mark Oppenheimer. Um, Advocate Oppenheimer is a practicing advocate at the Johannesburg Bar. He's appeared in the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court in a series of cases that is seeking to determine the boundaries between freedom of expression and genuine hate speech. He's also been interviewed on ENCA, CNBC, uh, Africa and Cliff Central to discuss a number of, of rights in the Bill of Rights and on issues concerning the rule of law. Along with Gwen Nugenia, he hosted the podcast Freedom Versus, and he currently hosts the popular philosophy um, series called Brain in a Vat. I suggest you go and have a look at that. Mark has also authored submissions to Parliament on hate speech, on the hate speech bill, and to the United Nations Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination on Escalating Racial Tensions in South Africa. He also recently published a submission to Parliament on the expropriation bill concerning expropriation without compensation. And he's also the co-author of Lockdown Did Government Do the Right Thing. Advocate Oppenheimer, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today um, and for availing yourself on a discussion on a controversial um, amendment bill that recently surfaced um, on, from the legislature in South Africa, um, the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act Amendment Bill. So thank you very much for joining us today, Mark. Absolute pleasure. Mark, if I could perhaps lead us off um, in your area of, of, of expertise. Um, I think most South Africans is not new to, to the unfortunate increase in what is known as hate speech um, in South Africa. And, and uh, a lot of South Africans know that hate speech in general is prohibited. Um, and that in, in, in the general sense, uh, in the lay sense, that one should not commit hate speech. Mark, can you perhaps elaborate a little bit on this, on, on what constitutes hate speech in South Africa and what, I mean, as, 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 as an expert in this field, what is the, the general legal framework on hate speech in South Africa? Well, there's two frameworks. So the, the first one is the constitution and the second one is this uh, Equality Act, which is um, facing amendment. Um, so let me start off by talking about the Constitution, and then I'll guide you through some of the developments that have happened over the years. So the Constitution in Section 16 grants all South Africans a very generous right to free speech. Uh, it includes the right to artistic creativity, freedom of the press, um, you know, academic research. Uh, it's incredibly broad. And it says there are three exceptions. So the first is propaganda for war. The second is the incitement of imminent violence. And the third is the hate speech clause which is advocacy of hatred on one of four grounds, race, gender, ethnicity, or religion, and that constitutes an incitement to cause harm. So let me unpack that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if we think about, you know, what are the things that are not part of the free speech right, we can see that they're connected to very severe consequences in the world. So the first being war, uh, the second being violence, and the third being harm. Now, with the harm, it's not that the words themselves cause the harm, it's that there is a call to action to go and perform harm against one of those four groups. So that constitutes an incitement to cause harm. Now, what's often described as hate speech um, doesn't actually fill this requirement. It's often the people that are prosecuted for hate speech have said some sort of racial slur uh, or they've said some kind of uh, sexist thing or something that's, you know, some kind of offensive speech and it's been described as hate speech, but it wouldn't constitute hate speech in terms of the constitution. So if we look at the Equality Act, the difficulty with the Act has been that there's been some ambiguity as to what the requirements are. So the Act had this phrase, hurtful speech, um, and it was unclear for a long time what the impact of that hurtful speech was. So there's some cases that say any speech that's hurtful speech is hate speech. Um, other other cases have said, no, in addition, you have to have this, you know, um, this incitement to cause harm as well. Um, the Supreme Court of Appeal weighed in and said that the act cannot be interpreted in a manner that's constitutional and they've struck it down as being unconstitutional. Um, that case has now gone to the Constitutional Court for confirmation. It's the case of Quilani, um, and we uh, await um, the court's finding in that regard. Okay. And um, I recall in the John Quilani matter, um, without going into too much detail in that matter, um, that was a case where Mr. Quilani made certain um, comments regarding um, homosexual persons and then the South African Human Rights Commission as well as a number of other parties took issue with that and then uh, the matter progressed from there. Yes, although I suppose one clarification might be that um, 
in John's article, what he talks about is uh, gay marriage as opposed to gay people. Okay. So um, he sort of, this is, we must also remember the article was written in 2008. 2008. So quite soon after um, gay marriage had been legalized in South Africa, which was in 2006. And so there'd been a long discussion, you know, up until that point about, you know, whether gay marriage is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and he sort of came out against the notion of gay marriage um, partly, I think, for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and then the hate speech complaint was was lodged against him. He's on record. It, John has, has passed away since, mm -hmm. um, but it was on record at the time of saying that he has many gay friends and he hopes that no harm is ever brought against a gay person. Understood. Yeah. No, Mark, I mean, thank you for that. So in unpacking that, um, the legal framework in South Africa regarding hate speech, uh, we've heard about uh, Section 16 of, of, of the Constitution, six, Section 16.1 and, and, and Section 16.2. And then also um, hate speech is examined in South Africa uh, in terms of Section 10 and, and also uh, by the wayside Section 12, but in essence Section 10 of the existing um, um, PEPUDA or, or, or Promotion of Equality and Prevention of, of, of Unfair Discrimination Act. Now, Mark, we've, we've, we've initiated this discussion telling everyone that there's, there's an amendment bill on the cards that seeks to amend certain provisions of the existing um, Pepuda legislation. Um, perhaps one of the things I would, I would, I would like to, to, to get from you, as I've said, section 10 of, of, of the existing Pepuda legislation um, makes it very clear that in order for certain comments or certain acts or, or, or conduct, but specifically words then, um, um, there's, there's a very clear um, intention or, or, or there's an intention requirement that must be shown. In other words, if someone uh, is to be convicted or, uh, or at least prosecuted in terms of that legislation for having allegedly committed hate speech, uh, in terms of that definition, intention to have committed or intention um, to commit hate speech is also a requirement. Will this be different in terms of the, of the, of the proposed amendment? Yes, so there's been... The intention question has been a muddy one in our law on hate speech for a while. The Constitution talks about this term advocacy of hatred. Mm -hmm. And the one view is that in order to advocate for something, you have to intend um, for the, you know, to, to incite the harm. Uh, it's not it's not sufficient for the words merely to have that effect, um, that you have to have the mental intention. Um, the, the language that's used in Section 10 is kind of much vaguer than that. It sort of talks about whether it could be reasonably could be reasonably construed that you had the intention, um, which is not the same as actually having the intention. Mm -hmm. What what the amendment will do um, is it redescribes what counts as discrimination, and um, and there it says that intent will not be a requirement for discrimination. Mm -hmm. It's then also. Uh, changes what counts as discrimination. Uh, and so one of the things that's described is um, having a, an impact on someone's um, dignity. Now, the way that our, our law currently works is that if you, if you insult someone, for example, and you impair their dignity, it's covered under the sort of Roman Dutch law of the Actio Inurium. Uh, and the idea there is that you have to intend to insult the person. You have to have a kind of consciousness of wrongfulness that I'm saying this to hurt you. Um, if I say something without that intent, and you happen to be offended, it's not actionable. And so what the change will do is it'll make that actionable. Now, why does this matter? Why, you know, what's the what's the import of this? Well, what we also used to have in South Africa during apartheid was the strict liability requirement for the press on defamation. So the the press could say something that was going to impact on the dignity of someone. Um, and it didn't matter whether they intended on doing that or not during apartheid, they were held liable. And this, uh, this position was then upended in our new constitutional dispensation, where uh, the court said, look, that's a huge infringement of the free speech rights, it's a huge imposition on a free press, um, and that you can't hold people liable, you know, just because they've, they've erred unintentionally. And so the concern with this amendment is that really what it does through the back door is change our rules on defamation. Um, and so members of the press could suddenly be held liable um, for writing things in their articles that you know could be said to prejudice others or interfere with their dignity. And those concepts are very, very broad. Mm -hmm. um, 
even though it's unintentional. Um, so it would be a kind of rewriting of our law of defamation and really a kind of going back to the dark days of apartheid on that front. Okay. No, I mean, thank you for that. A lot of commentary that that, that is currently being levied on the, on the proposed um, amendment um, or amendments in terms of, of, of the amendment bill centralizes around this, this, this removal of, 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 of the intention um, to discriminate. Um, but I mean, aside from that, if, 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 if you, and, and upon a light reading of it, what would your other concerns be, or your main concerns, if I could call it that, in terms of, of, of the amendment bill? Well, one of the, the major concerns I have isn't even mentioned in the sort of brief memo that was sent out to, to, you know, to the public to say comment on this thing. They basically said, look, we're going to redefine equality and we're going to redefine what counts as discrimination. Um, and when you get down to the bottom of, of, the, of the bill, there's something there that should strike terror in the hearts of every single organization in this country. Uh, really, it is, it is like so frightening. So there's been a view for a long time that government is very hostile towards the NGO sector. And has been trying to find some kind of way of regulating it. And really, this amendment bill is exactly that. So what it does is it gives ministers the power to introduce codes to enforce these uh, new equality and discrimination definitions on NGOs, also traditional leaders, by the way, as well. Um, and it'll also create financial obligations. So all the NGOs will have to produce some sort of um, document to explain what they're doing to enhance equality. And equality, as I say, has been, the meaning of that term has been dramatically changed. It creates all these positive obligations, um, you know, to make sure that everyone has the same stuff so, you know, if we think about equality in liberal terms, you know, it's the idea that we're all equal before the law, you know, that there's procedural equality. We don't expect us to have an equality of outcomes. Um, you know, we know that in a competitive society, people are going to use their skills, you know, to advance themselves. You know, it's only communist utopian societies that aim for an equality of outcomes. And this amendment makes it very clear that equality of outcomes, it's in the language of the definition is what is sought. Also, we know, given the state's sort of penchant for, you know, demographic representativity, this will be used as a way to say to NGOs, the people that you've, you know, work in your organization don't match the demographics of the country. So, you know, you need to have uh, an equal distribution on the grounds of, let's say, language, on race, on gender, sexual orientation. Bear in mind that the, um, the, the original act has 17 different grounds um, on which you know you can discriminate against. So you know you might need to have the exact number of disabled people or people that speak vendor or whatever it is in your organization, regardless of what it is that your organization does. Um, so you can imagine, for example, that your organization is about um, you know enhancing access to Zulu reading materials. Um, you could have a cap on how many Zulu speakers you have in your organization, you might be required to have X number of Afrikaans speakers in your organization because we need to have demographic representativity and equality. So, and then also you have to set aside money in your budget for this. So how do you cripple a poor NGO sector? Well, you make them spend a lot of money, you know, complying. So that's something that all NGOs ought to be terrified by. Yeah, and that, I think one of the one of the tales to 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 that requirement is also uh, if you if you are are not in a position to 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 budget for that or if you are unable to show that you've actually set aside money or funds for this um, there's an added procedure or process in, in in which you will have to explain that to the relevant uh, 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 appointed person or or, or, or um, um, representative uh, to explain for this. Yes, and there's even a, a further irony. So in legislation which is meant to be about equality and non-discrimination, it says that the minister can decide which particular NGOs and people it wants to regulate depending on their size and their influence and their resources. So basically, you can create an FW de Klerk Foundation code and say, well, we think that you have a sufficient amount of resources and influence for us to make it really, really hard for you to operate. But you guys, you know, we think it's okay. So you kind of wind up with this Henry VIII Bill of Attainment stuff where you can go and like target particular organizations that don't vibe with your agenda. So on, 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 on that premise, it's, it, it, it's safe to say perhaps that the reality exists that different codes could be written for, for, for different organizations. And like you said, uh, and as I understand you, it doesn't matter how big or small your NGO is. And presumably the smaller uh, 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 
you know, there's the risk that 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 perhaps you know there are less funds to, in in order to to show compliance with this. But then, in essence, different codes could apply to different NGOs, and that is um, in the hands of of the appointed and relevant minister. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's very explicit that that's exactly what their plan is. I mean, again, that should be terrifying to people. No, it's 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 terrifying, uh, most certainly. And then, Mark, I mean, we've 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 heard now what you say about about NGOs and 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 all of that. Would would this be the same for for for? Or let me ask it in a different way. What other organisations or institutions? Um, if this is going to be the situation for NGOs, are there any other bodies or institutions or organizations that will be touched by this? Yeah, there's quite a few. So the state itself has to take on all these obligations. So all these government departments, you know, have to kind of uh, abide by, you know, this, this new kind of regime. Um, also, it specifically mentions that anyone doing business with the state, um, you know, will be required to do this um, and have all these financial reporting requirements. Um, I mean, to give you an idea, the the aim of, of the act is to have a revolution in terms of our entire legal system. So it explicitly says that there needs to be an audit of all laws so that they conform with this act uh, and that there must be a massive audit process to ensure that you know, everything abides by this, you know, anti-discrimination, pro-equality stuff. Now, what's so clever about what they've done? If you ask anyone, is equality a good thing? Everyone says, yes, of course, equality is a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. And discrimination, it's a bad thing. Yeah, of course, it's a bad thing. But when you go and change the meanings of those words, so that they mm -hmm. no longer match the ordinary meanings of the words, you keep the valence, in other words, the kind of positive or negative association with the word. Mm -hmm. And it makes it very hard to sort of, you know, fight the, the legislation. You know, imagine I have the uh, anti-child pornography bill. Okay, and in that, I also say, and we can confiscate people's microwaves and cars, mm -hmm. you know, and so now someone says, I don't want my microwave and cars confiscated. So, oh, so you're in favor of child pornography, then are you, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, it's such a clever trick where you sort of say, oh, so you don't believe in equality, you're against this legislation. No, 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 I do believe in equality, just not the bizarro notion that you have. <laughs> um, I think it brings me to, to the next point that I want to raise. I mean, Mark, if we, if we look at this, I mean, South Africa has a very liberal, a very progressive constitution. Um, it really entrenches um, freedom of expression, not just freedom of speech, but freedom of expression um, in, 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 in section 16.1 and 16.2. Um, the original Papuda legislation and, and, and the wording of section 10, um, I mean, as you said, it is currently being evaluated in the John Quilani matter, the constitutionality or not, uh, or otherwise of section 10. But we have a very, very, I think, progressive framework regulating this, um, and, and, and especially freedom of expression. Um, because in as much as, as prevention of discrimination, the promotion of equality and the prevention uh, of harassment is important, this must be balanced um, with, with, with a very healthy uh, uh, respect for freedom of expression, which is equally important to any constitutional democracy. What, what is the international comparable position um, I mean, what, what would the example or, or what would the position be, for example, in countries like the United States on, on hate speech or freedom of expression? The United States, I know, is particularly strong in advocating for freedom of expression. It's one of their core fundamental rights. Um, but what would, what would comparable countries in, in, in a situation like this do? Because it sounds to me like we're talking, um, in a sense, socialist regulation down to the smallest levels of a constitutional democratic society or what is supposed to be a constitutional democratic society um, in terms of rule of law and in terms of, of the provisions of our constitution and not, for example, um, socialist regulation like this down to the minute, down to the smallest level. But what would, what would, what would examples from, from overseas be or from other jurisdictions? Yeah, so there are a kind of a range of different approaches that you can have. Um, so the Americans tend to have the, the greatest protection for free speech. So their constitution says that Congress shall pass no law which abridges the right to freedom of expression. Um, and they do have some exceptions. So for example, you know, defamation is still actionable in America. Uh, um, they have a, a kind of uh, imminent violence test there. So they sort okay. of talk about you can't scream fire in a crowded theater, you know, it'll cause a stampede and people will lose their lives. So you can abridge certain kinds of speech. Um, so on the other end of the spectrum, you kind of wind up with these very totalitarian regimes yeah. um, that go and they ban books, um, you know, they sort of, you know, 
the, the 10th of May um, was the anniversary of Nazi book burnings. So in 1933, um, Nazi student organizations went and rounded up books, uh, you know, that they deemed to be um, problematic, you know, right. and, right. Uh, you know, they said, you know, these books are anti-German and we don't like their content and they're, they're sinister and they burnt them and they encouraged, um, uh, they encouraged the press to cover the book burnings. So, you know, that, that footage is still sort of widely available and Americans at the time, you know, saw this, this footage coming back to them and they, they looked on in horror as you know, Nazis. Time, yeah destroyed you know like the treasures of treasures of the world um and we now find ourselves i think in a sort of strange cultural moment where people celebrate uh the censoring uh, of works so even though america has very strong free speech laws in practice the culture is sort of moving against it so you have um especially on american college campuses mm -hmm. a move to sort of um ban certain free people from speaking uh, we've seen like rather kind of innocuous books being banned so there's six Dr. Zeus books um, that have been unpublished. So the the entity that holds the copyrights to Dr. Zeus has said, we're no longer going to publish these books. Um, and that means you can't buy the stuff on Amazon. And if you own a physical copy of the book, you couldn't sell it on eBay either because eBay then banned the sale of these books. And these are children's books. Um, you know, I mean, there's sort of some of the stuff you'd, you'd really have to rack your mind to work out what was the offensive. You know, so there's that kind of cultural shift. Um, what you find in some some other countries is that there's this move to sort of say, well, if anyone's offended by the speech, then we're going to ban it. Um, and that's really, really dangerous. You know, the, the worry with sort of lowering the threshold of speech to what you deem offensive is that you wind up with everything being offensive and then there's nothing left to read. You know, the, there's this famous book by Ray Bradbury called Fahrenheit 451 which is the temperature at which paper burns. And the, the novel opens with this fireman. And instead of putting out a fire, he's starting a fire and he's burning these books. And so you think, oh, this must be sort of, you know, similar to a Nazi regime, you know, where you've got the state sort of enforcing this. And throughout the novel, you realize it hasn't come from the state authority. It's really come from, from the public. And it's come from people saying, you know, there's this one word in this book that just makes me feel quite uncomfortable. Why don't you just... Can't you just take it out? Is it really so hard? Is it so onerous? And it's, you know, of course, we understand there's a sensitivity. And then, it's, well, it's not just this one word. It's the sentence. It's this paragraph. It's this book. It's this library. You know, And it's so easy to kind of go down that slippery slope. You don't have principled lines in the sand. Now, I'm not a free speech absolutist, by the way. You know, I think that there are certain kinds of speech that are actually dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if you have people calling for genocide, you know, if you have, you know, this sort of, clear move um, to cause harm to, to vulnerable groups, that's good reason to prohibit that speech. And so I think, you know, our constitution strikes the right balance between saying, look, we need free speech because we need to be able to, we need to be able to get to the truth of things. People have to be free to say controversial things. And if you think about, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, John Quilani's concerns about gay marriage. So Africa was the fifth country in the world to have gay marriage. Why did we have it? Because we could have a free and open dialogue about it. People could persuade each other. You know, they could change their minds. It was seen as an incredibly offensive thing to have said that gay people should be allowed to get married. Lots of people said, no, you can't say that. I don't like hearing that. And then they heard it and they changed their minds. You know, it's, it would have been unconscionable um, to have had uh, interracial marriage during the height of apartheid, you know. Um, it would have seen as a offensive thing to have said. But because we allowed free speech, because we allowed people to say the stuff that was deemed offensive in the day, we could actually make progress. Because human beings are fallible. We're not really that good at knowing what, what the true thing is. We have to kind of do this experimenting exercise. Mm -hmm. And free speech is the way we get there. No, I mean, Mark, thank you for that. I think um, um, something else that, that, that caught my attention, and perhaps we can, we can use this point, almost in a, in a, in a, in a last sense and, and, and before we wrap up, the, the Pepuda Amendment Bill also has um, a number of clauses uh, and it speaks very strongly to vicarious liability. Um, and this would, this would, I mean, all the organizations we spoke about, NGOs, uh, individuals, uh, organizations, even state entities, uh, what would the effect of this be? And when we speak of vicarious liability, especially in the sense of discrimination, um, or hate speech. Yeah, I, I thought it really opened up some serious liability. Um, it struck me that one of the reasons for this change uh, in the legislation was to try and deal with these kind of clicks cases. So if we think about the clicks case, um, you have 
an advertising agency that um, produces an ad, um, which they say they had no intention to cause any offense. Mm -hmm. You know, there's these different types of hair. You have like, um, you know, uh, greasy hair and um, flat hair and fine hair and normal hair, you know, um, that's the sort of range of descriptions that hairdressers tend to use to describe mm -hmm. types of hair and types of shampoos. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they sort of, what they had in the ad was that the dry damaged hair had uh, a black model and that the um, normal hair uh, had a white model. Normal hair is actually not seen as a kind of uh, positive thing to have. You know, uh, it's sort of bland. Uh, so like buoyant, voluptuous hair, those would be seen as good things. I recall the narrative of that, of that particular matter, yes. So the question is, well, can you hold clicks liable for this? You know, clicks says, well, you know, listen, um, you know, we just happened to be in the business of selling Tresemme, this particular shampoo, and we, you know, didn't play a role in, in the construction of this ad, you know, so it's that particular person, if you want to hold them liable, and they go, look, I don't have any intent. So how do you hold clicks liable? Well, you say, well, let's remove the intent requirement and let's create vicarious liability. So now what you can do is you can sue clicks because, you know, you can say, well, I was offended when I saw this ad, even though the agent who did it, you know, mm -hmm. um, had no intent to cause the offense. And I mean, I'll, I'll give you an idea of the kind of chaos that will be created by doing this. So there's an interesting debate in America at the moment um, about banning menthol cigarettes. Okay. So the Food and Drug Administration says that um, they want to ban menthol cigarettes because they have a disproportionate effect on black people in the gay community um, and that they're more likely to smoke those cigarettes and they're more likely to suffer the negative health consequences attached to the cigarettes. Okay, So they've said the sale of menthol cigarettes is discriminatory, the language that they've used, and therefore they should be banned. You then have Al Sharpton, who's you know uh, one of the very notable uh, black civil rights activists in the States. And he says, but menthol cigarettes are particularly enjoyed by the black community. If you ban them, you're going to have, um, first of all, you're depriving them of something that they greatly enjoy. Um, something like 80% of menthol sales are mm -hmm. to African-Americans. And also you're going to create a further risk to them, which is that people will engage in some sort of illegal sales, which will mean that they'll have confrontations with the police, which could lead to you know, violence erupting. Mm -hmm. So what you have is that on the law, the banning and the non-banning of the menthol cigarettes are both discriminatory. So now what? What are you supposed to do? How do you regulate your conduct in advance? Because, you know, as I said, there's been a change in definition. So it's acts and omissions that count and intentions yeah. out the window. Yeah. So you just don't know what to do. There's nothing you can do to stop your employees from creating liability for you um, because they're going to sort of, you know, either fail to do things or do things unintentionally. People are going to bumble through life and make these supposed errors. Someone's going to get upset by something. Um, so you're going to have this flood of litigation. Um, yeah, so quite a dangerous thing. Okay. Now, I mean, Mark, thank you, you know, very, very much. Um, we're almost running a bit out of time, but that's fine. Thank you very, very much for your views and for your comments and inputs um, on the Pipura Amendment Bill. Um, most certainly, like you say, actually, uh, on the face of it, seems and seemingly very innocuous and almost in a sense very innocent but indeed if one goes to read the text of the bill and the proposed amendments with some very serious consequences for a number um, of role players but indeed all south africans um, and really as it goes down to to almost rewriting uh, a number of important definitions on on discrimination what constitutes discrimination uh, which also ties into into hate speech and this will have uh, a circling out effect to, to like you described, companies, individuals, um, NGOs, big or small, uh, even state-owned enterprises, state entities. Uh, we've spoken about the vicarious liability for employers. So most certainly, almost everyone down to the wire will be affected by a seemingly innocuous piece of, le uh, 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 of proposed legislation, but with tremendous, tremendous circling out effects. So Mark Oppenheimer, thank you very, very much for, for your views and your inputs on this and having a quick discussion with us and sharing your expertise. What we will do, we will share this video on the Foundation's YouTube channel. So please go and have a look at that. Um, if people are interested, and to all of you who are interested in, in having a look at these proposed amendments and indeed commenting on the bill, the original uh, date for, for, for delivering comments um, was the 12th of May. However, a number of organizations um, have received uh, a, a further extension to the end of May, to the 30th, uh, of May or to the end of this month um, to deliver submissions to the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. So go have a look at their website on, on, on where to send your comments. And 
help us to deliver comment on this bill and share your inputs and make your voice heard on the Pepuda Amendment Bill. Um, and again, to Advocate Mark Oppenheimer from the Janusburg Bar. Mark, thank you for your time, for availing yourself and having a discussion with us. Good luck, and we'll speak again soon. Thank you.